So that's, it's good that I talked about it, so now we know uh, that uh, it's okay for you to take these grapes. Then again, you know, okay, take the grapes. Now, of course, it's the end of the season, not so many, but what will happen, okay, somebody says, oh, nice grapes. You come with the bag before you go home and you fill the bag. So you see, again, there's every situation that is different. So maybe that would make Danny upset. Maybe it would make him very happy. Finally, somebody takes the grapes because it's, we're not taking them. It doesn't make a mess on the floor, I don't know. Yeah, but even though it seems as if nobody wants it, um, it's okay, okay? Nobody wants it, so we still good to ask. Okay, verse 121. Um, uh, it was the 20, I think. Okay, 20. Those who ever wishes to quickly afford protection to both himself and other beings should practice the holy secret, the exchanging of self for others. This oh, we no, have. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so this we'll do, of course, the meditation on Tom Lane. This is how we train first. Yeah, but always we kind of, before we go, this is why it's very skillful, it's being built up with people that we do like, people we don't like, people we don't know, and then the people we don't like. But we'll do the meditation either before lunch, maybe, briefly, just with ourselves, or with the ones that we like, and then in the afternoon a bit with all the categories. Okay, so, yeah, this one with the body. Because of our attachment to my body, because of attachment to my body, even a small object of fear frightens me. So who would not revile as an enemy this body that gives rise to fear? So I was preparing for this weekend in the Vashasava retreat, and I was going, at night I was going through these verses when I fell upon these verses. I was, you know, every half an hour another bait bar came out, trying to find his food, and I thought, gosh, this is so true, these tiny little things, you know. Yesterday the mosquito also, you know, one mosquito can produce fear, mm -hmm. because we have this attachment to the body, because of course it seems normal, yeah, but it hurts. Yeah, so. So, uh, Pema Chodron says here, sometimes Shantideva speaks of the body as the precious vehicle for the journey to enlightenment. And sometimes he points out the disadvantages. Here he says that our obsession with the body causes a lot of anxiety. And it's true, you know, it's like people judge you for your body. So, but you don't have to believe them that they think you're stupid just because you're not beautiful and you're not slim, for example. Yeah, you don't have to believe them, but that's how society is. The first thing that they judge you on is how you look. And we do the same thing. So why would we judge others that we also do the same thing? If you don't do the same thing, then just be very happy. So kind of. Now, it's giving up self-cherishing. So these, the next three verses, they go together. Mm -hmm. By wishing for a means to remedy the hungry, thirst, and sickness of the body, I might kill birds, fish, and deer, and loiter by the sides of roads to rob others. So we're, you know, in order to keep this body alive, we do all kinds of non-ethical things that we would find them very unethical if they're done to us. You know, if somebody comes to kill us and says, oh, I'm hungry, I need some food, you're not going, oh, okay, I understand. This is nature, you know, this is what Lama Zopa said in Bern, he said, when we see a cat going after a mouse, we say, well, yeah, it's its nature. Then he said, if you have a tiger running after you, you wouldn't just say, oh, yeah, it's its nature, you know, you would want to run away, you would feel threatened, a little bit like this. And also there was another, there was another with, you know, what is not mine, and then we call it mine. If you're a hunter or a fisher, um, even if you buy meat or, or fish or whatever, the piece of meat that you see or the animal that you see and you're about to shoot or to fish is definitely not I. We don't see this as I or me. Then you catch it. Then it becomes already mine. So it's already more or you buy it and then it's mine. But then you eat it, you put it in the body, and then it transforms. These things transform into muscles and whatever. And then we call it I. You know? So this is how, again, it's how it changes from something that 
It's the same object. It was not mine, or it was not I, but then it becomes mine, and then it is, is I, the body. I have such a beautiful body, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you ever think of all the cucumbers you ate because though you have this beautiful body? No, it's my body. As if the I has created the body. You know, do you say thank you to the farmers who grow your vegetables so that you can have a healthy body? Hopefully. But in order to protect and to feed the body, we kind of are able to do all kinds of things. Um, and for the body service and advantage, maybe I should use this one. If for the sake of its profit and comfort, I would kill even my father and mother, hopefully not us, but it happens, yeah, uh, and steal the property of the triple gem, then I would undoubtedly proceed to burn in the flames of the deepest hells. Because karmically, these three objects, I mean, three objects are the most powerful objects with karma, is like your teachers or the three jewels because they lead you to enlightenment, your parents because they give you this body with which you can practice, and the sick and the poor. So if you want to do good, you know, spend your money not on your friends who have everything anyway, and you know, you buy them beautiful things, spend your money on either of these objects. Yeah? So, I, you know, it always sounds a bit like self-interest, but like putting Dana in the box there, right? You make it possible for the Dharma to be able to continue in Israel. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, I don't need the money. It's not that, I do not need the money. I have enough money and people invite me and give me food and all this. Um, if there's money left over, I do take it by all means, yeah? But if there's no money left, and for them to cover all the costs, it's fine. I don't mind. I'm not coming here for the money. So please don't think that, oh, what, there is no da big dana. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. So, um, uh, but when you put the money in the box, I mean, you're actually paying for future visits of teachers. So, so be aware of that, and be very happy that you can make this happen, because for my visit, I mean, that one is, I'm here, so you don't need to pay for my visit. I'm here, mm -hmm. right? People drive me, and people feed me, and I'm staying with people that don't charge any money, so it's very, it's very good. But in order for people to come and to be able to rent places, uh, the world is working with money. So if you can have that awareness, only then, you create the karma of supporting the dharma when you have that awareness when you put the money in the box. Karma is created by the mind. Yeah, the way you, your attitude. And then if you do this with a happy attitude, then all the better, of course. Uh, okay, 124. Uh, therefore, what wise man would desire, protect and venerate his body? Who would not scorn it and regard it as an enemy? People are sometimes so afraid of suffering any harm that they are willing to kill or steal to protect themselves. These self-protective tendencies can be dangerous, just as dangerous as treating ourselves with contempt. In a way, Shantideva's logic about egocentricity should be starting to become clear. So the Mahayana teachings say that the reason we don't do anything to others is because we care about them. Because we value the lives of others, we do not kill. Because we respect their property, we do not steal. Not only do we refrain from negative actions, so that is creating positive karma, but at the same time, we practice loving kindness because we do it out of concern for them. Yeah, so that's why it's very important. But again, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. um, as I said, I stayed three nights in that room, then I thought, okay, that's enough. And um, so that's what the Dalai Lama also says. He says, one mosquito, kind of okay. But then two, three, four, uh, like, yeah. yeah. But it's, you know, if you can protect your body by all means, and if you can protect your body without harming anybody else, all the better. Yeah, but um, this is a tricky thing here, you know? What do you do? Do you just say, 
um, it, because not only you, you also may, might have family, children, and if it's only you, you can say, okay, I die, no problem, you know. If we can die like this, like, um, what, what was his name? Um, this, um, the prince, Mahasattva maybe, uh, who gave his body to the tigress, you know. Mm. He said, well, okay, he said even, he thought my parents will suffer so much. But I want to give my body to this tigress who is not eating her children. And then these five children became his first disciples, of his five tiger cops. So are we, can we do this happily? This is the big thing, you know, as long as we can't do it happily, as long as we can't give our life like this, then don't. This is what Keshadava always said. Yeah, start to give vegetables, start to give you food that you would need. Because you see, we only train with things that we don't need. But start to train with things that, okay, I give my food, but then there's nothing for me. Start like this. And see how difficult that already is, or to give up your seat on the bus or on the train. Yeah, already that is difficult, even though it's a short journey, maybe an hour or so, or even then we want to sit. We start with these things. And then as we get used to, okay, to be happy that to see somebody else is eating that food, then we then we can go to bigger things, I think. But again, don't limit yourself too much. Be a little bit courageous. Give something that you would use or that, that you would need. You know, we're very generous with things that we don't need. And then we feel generous and fantastic instead of thinking, instead of saying, oh, thank you very much for taking it when somebody takes something. Because the real receiver, again, is me. When I give something, the one who receives long-term is me. And then we feel so noble. Now, we turn this whole thing around, at least also attitude-wise. If I give this, what shall I have left to enjoy? If I give this food now, <gasps> what shall I eat? Then you got nothing. doesn't matter. Yeah? Such selfish thinking is the way of hungry ghosts. If I enjoy this, what shall I have left to give? Such selfless thinking is a quality of the gods. And we can do that. We can definitely do that. I, sometimes I have things that people give me that are really delicious or really good. And I know to whom I want to give it because I know that they will enjoy it more. So I don't eat it. And I, and I give it. And it's so much joy to give something good. Much better than to eat it yourself or to use it yourself. Yeah? But usually we think like this, oh, if I give this, what, what will I have? And we forget that we have now enough because we practice generosity in the past. We don't really trust the law of cause and effect. Well, we would trust it if something comes, up, comes back immediately, then yes, you know. But sometimes it only comes next life. Then well, I don't know what I did in order to have enough now. It's funny with money, also with resources, it's like some people work, 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 really hard. They never get anywhere. Some other people, it just falls in their lap. So we can say, okay, coincidence, he's lucky, I'm not lucky. But there's this thing about karma, that there's results from our actions. But again, you know, Shantideva would say, well, I'll give everything. I say, be careful. Otherwise you become like the person that, you know, he goes, he gives everything away because he thinks Buddhism is about not wanting. You can give everything away and still want, even more than before, than when you have. Uh, and then he goes to a cave and tries to meditate, and then he doesn't know how to meditate, he doesn't have any instructions, and he comes back down to the village and says, Buddhism made me poor. <coughs> yeah. So give whatever you can plus a little more. Same was with the meditation, you know, when you want to move or you want to finish it, one more minute. And don't wait until the minute is finished. This is also what I started teaching to people. You have very little free time. You have moments when you have to wait for somebody, for something. Don't wait. Open up and think, ah, oh, fantastic, he's not here yet. Nothing else to do at the moment. Because it's that's a quality state of mind. Waiting is 
tense. Waiting is not being present. Waiting is looking. Where's the train? Where's the train? You know, people who go to the in the platform. It's so funny to see them sometimes. They look in the direction where the train should be, as if the train is coming earlier when they look. <laughs> but we all have this attitude. I also have this attitude. I also look. This is why I became aware of what I'm doing. And then I see other people doing the same thing, hoping that it should come first. So when you have the traffic light also in this red, notice the mind of waiting and open up. Just open up and use the time to practice being present happily. Wow, I have few free seconds. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, so that the next one. Um, wow. <laughs> If to serve myself I harm another, I'll suffer later in the realm of hell. If for others' sake I harm myself, every excellence will be my heritage. So that can be the revenge for your boss, you know, to kind of bosses you around and is you abusing his power. You think, haha, in your next life you'll be the one who is below. But I warn you of these thoughts. Because if we have these thoughts, it's negative rejoicing. And when it's your turn to be in power, and the others turn like the karma right to be below, you'll be the one bossing him around because your mind is kind of attracted in a very subtle way to these kinds of things. When you are being bossed around, know that that's it. I am purifying negative karma here. I've done the same thing to others. It's very painful to think like that. It's very painful. You will see. We'll do this afternoon Tonglen Tong meditation where we take the habits of somebody that we criticize. We take these habits upon ourselves. It's like the mind goes, no way. Yeah. Even you calm yourself down, but I can transform it. Yeah. So, so we shouldn't create anger connections with these minds. Yeah. Because then. Of course, that then they will be will be attracted to go into the same situations, and we'll do the opposite. We don't even have to wait till next life. We can see it very often. If children have been abused, that when they are grown ups, they abuse others, or even already teenagers. That's what they learned. Yeah. So then, when we see it, you know, we feel okay. This happening, it's, it's shit. It's not good. It's not nice. The action definitely no good. And as we did yesterday, I will never do this. Yeah? Even if I have power, I will never do this. And then maybe you come home and you have a cleaning woman and she wants the salary but she didn't clean. You see the same behavior as your boss. Maybe a bit milder, but the same attitude. I pay you, therefore you have to do your job. <coughs> also in restaurants sometimes, you know, how customers behave sometimes. It's this thing, customer is king. Why? You know, why should the customer be king? I don't understand. I don't understand this reasoning. They can be happy that somebody schleps the things for them that they only have to take it out of the shelf and puts it nicely and help you to find when you're looking for something. So whenever you feel like you're not being treated right or whatever, then Look, what makes me think I should be treated in a different way? Why should I be the king here? Let the, the seller be the king. Treat them like this, and then they will serve you happily. But if you already come with a lot of demands and this and that, very aggressive. I'm sure none of you, but I've seen behavior of people, customers, not just in Israel, but especially in Israel. They <laughs> like appalling. They treat them really like shit. And maybe some of you who have so-called lonely jobs, you know? Why, why are the rich people rich? Because people have lonely jobs and they don't get paid for them properly. That's why they, people can amass all this money, the other ones. And we're part of them, yeah? So, if you can, you know, like every time, especially cleaning, cleaning personnel, I mean, it's so wonderful, you know, they come and clean your stuff. So treat them nicely. I know that you treat yours nicely. So, you know, really be grateful that they do this. You only give your money that you're not lacking the money when you give the money. 
is it? It's not that we have to say, oh, nobody has a cleaning woman who then can't buy shoes or food. Yeah? But most of the people have a cleaning woman. You don't even, whether you have the money or don't have it, your life doesn't change at all, isn't it? So at least we can treat them, you know, I think, thank you, and maybe pay them even a bit more, or I don't know. You, you know how to, how to treat them, because that's this verse, okay? If to serve myself I harm another, I suffer later in the realms of hell. If for others' sake I harm myself, every excellence will be my heritage. If you're ready to serve, even if you don't have to, but if you're ready to serve, you will then have excellence. That's how karma works. But you shouldn't think like that. It's just how it works. Yeah. How karma works. Do, you, do we trust that? Do we think that's true? Yeah. Like if you, if you, that's it. If you decide to serve, then it's not a problem. Because you decided it, you do it voluntarily. If you're forced to serve, then you don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> but if you, if you choose, to serve, even though it's difficult. Yesterday we talked about this. You know, even though you choose something, it can still be difficult. Doesn't mean that if you choose it, it's easy. I saw where I slept in the room tonight, there was this, you know, the Simpsons. Uh, I don't know them, unfortunately, but though there's this, the guy, the father, I think, who has a beer, and the saying says, Whatever is hard to do is not worthwhile doing. <laughs> you know, just sitting with his beer. But that's in Buddhist terms is absolutely not true. Uh, but that's how a lazy mind is. Why bother? Like, oh. Yeah. So this is why I always say, you know, when we're in Esamim or Tuval or whatever, because also at the beginning I was really shocked how people left their rooms. You know, everything lying around, garbage, this, and bed, and blue. So I started saying, please, you know, try to leave the room as if you're the cleaning woman or the cleaning man who comes to clean it up. And then slowly, slowly, it had become a habit. After the Vasha Supper retreat, I didn't say anything, but I saw the boys taking off the sheets. Yeah? It becomes a habit, and it's a good feeling. It's really a good feeling to do something that you don't necessarily need to do, but you leave it in a, in a way, and then when they see you next time, they're happy, you know? That's what people remember from you, when you treat them in, in a nice way, and also with the cleaning woman in Nesamim, you know, the one with the clothes, I mean, we have become such good friends. She's such a nice lady, and she's doing a hard job with all these volunteers who don't know what they're doing. <laughs> So, one thing what is best for me, stupidity and lower realms result. Let this be changed, applied to others, honors and the realms of bliss will come. The advantage of cherishing others is like, you know, even, also even in this life. Um, of course, people who are very negative, they also become very famous, but we don't, do what you do, we don't want to have that kind of renowned, but people are very unselfish and they, they become very famous and they're very liked. They're liked by everybody, yeah? already in this life. Enslaving others, forcing them to serve me, I will come to know the state of servitude, but I labor for the good of others, mastery and leadership will come to me. I mean, it explains itself, yeah? Okay, so if you are in a position of power, do not abuse it, please. Because also, you're, you know, there was, I don't know how it is now, but there used to be work in Switzerland, there used to be these work ethics that people who owned companies, they understood if my workers are happy. I think it was Google who started with it. So they made all these, you know, these leisure rooms where they could relax and all this. They started, they perform better if they're happy. Of course, you shouldn't do it like this. So they sent the people to mindfulness courses by understanding that if people have mindfulness, they're happier and therefore they can work better, which is true on top of it. But that shouldn't be the, that shouldn't be the attitude. All the joy the world contains has come through wishing happiness for others. All the misery the world contains has come to wanting pleasure for myself. So this verse is quoted, that's Pema Chodron, who says, is quoted very often by His Holiness Dalai Lama. Mm, 
Because she, she takes the film Groundhog Day. I don't know if anybody has seen it. It repeats, repeats, repeats until he, I think it's Tom Hanks, mm. until he got the message. An aggressive man relives the same day over and over until he finally gets it right. He tries every possible selfish strategy to find happiness, which only increases his dissatisfaction and frustration. We can see it in others when they're very selfish, but we don't see it in ourselves, unfortunately. After all, he spends his day helping others. Why? Not to make people think he's a good person, but because it's the only thing that brings him joy. Every day he catches the same little boy falling from the tree, and every day the little boy runs away without saying thank you. Every morning he tries to save the life of a homeless man he has grown fond of, and every day he fails. But as he relives that day over and over again, he becomes more open and more warm, and people understandably are beginning to love him. So, yeah, we want others to love you, then we have to love them. Also, I think there was something, I don't remember who it was, but it's so true, you know. You don't have to change people, you just have to like them. Because then your heart is open. Is there need for lengthy explanation? How is it here? But what need is there to say much more? The childish work for their own benefit. The Buddhas work for the benefit of others. Just look at the difference between them. Clear, yeah? If I do not give away my happiness for others' pain, enlightenment will never be attained. And even in samsara, joy will fly from me. As we meditated yesterday, what we want others to, we want them to relate to us in a respectful way, in an appreciative way, in a way, you know, we all have these kind of expectations. So it's a bit much to expect everybody to treat us like that. So we can start, as long as it's not harmful, like physically harmful, words are just words. You know, we learned this in chapter number six. Words are words, so what you make of them, you can make them weapons, but you can also make them words, syllables put together. You don't have to believe what people say. It's so difficult, yeah? It's so difficult. They say, you're stupid? Okay, you're stupid. Somebody told me, you're so stupid, you know, with your kind of, yeah, giving courses, not charging any money. I said, okay, I don't mind being stupid, but I'm joyful stupid. I prefer being joyful, stupid, than, uh, you know, unhappy, intelligent. I don't mind. People talk, some people tell me I'm naive and blah, blah, what will happen to you when you're old? Well, now I am old, <laughs> so I'm still okay. I don't have to worry, so, so a little bit like that. Um, but even in samsara, joy will fly from me, like, um, in, even in cyclic existence, have, have shall have no joy, no joy, yeah? If you want to volunteer somewhere, by the way, you have to learn to be a happy volunteer, and a happy volunteer is only a volunteer who does whatever is needed to be done. An unhappy volunteer is somebody who says, I only do this, and I only do it to this amount. I mean, I saw it in Tushita. We had people who came working at the office, and they thought it would be an office job. You know, you, you start at eight and you finish at five. But in a meditation center, it's not like this. Somebody gets sick, you have to bring them down to the doctor, somebody has diarrhea, you have to go and buy yogurt, uh, ask the kitchen to boil some rice, blah, blah, and this and that. And these people, who they were always overburdened. The ones who left at five o'clock, and then we had to go and find them, and from time to time they had to do something, maybe after hours, you know. They always felt, oh, it's too much, and oh. Others who were just present, like Fred and Maya, 24 hours available, these two. They were so happy. They were such happy volunteers. And sometimes I see it, you know, when somebody explained to me why she can't do this now. I tell you, it takes longer to explain <laughs> why she cannot do this instead of doing it. <laughs> And we're all very happy when we know it would be good to do something, we do it, and then that creates so much happiness. Avoiding it doesn't create any happiness. Yet we're still kind of, you know, we're still in that 
poor me kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's difficult. I mean, being volunteers, it's really difficult. Because also, especially when it's when it's Buddhist groups, you know, one has big expectations how they should behave. They should be good.